Well, it's 10 o'clock in Huntington Beach, and we want to welcome you to worship at LCR this morning. Our praise team is on vacation, and so this morning I want to thank Mike Guskowski and James Reed for being with us. Because it's just the three of us and our technical staff, Nick, we want to do something a little different today. So rather than having our normal praise band and praise music, we're going to go back in Christian music a little bit and do some revival tunes. Now, you may not know this, but before there were surfers in Huntington Beach, there were Methodists, meaning that uh, there were huge Methodist revivals happening in Long Beach back at the early part of the 1900s. And as Long Beach became more crowded, they started coming down to Huntington Beach, setting up large tent encampments and having large Methodist revivals. In fact, the biggest building in Huntington Beach was a revival hall that they built just over off 11th Street that stood for many decades, and they would host Methodists, and they would host the Grand Army of the Republic, which was veterans of the Civil War gathering for unit reunions. Now, the thing that ended all the Methodists camping in Huntington Beach was the oil boom that happened in 1920. So 100 years ago, everything changed in Huntington Beach when they discovered oil. But before that, Huntington Beach was known for its tent encampments, its revival, its revival music, and the presence of people trying to get closer to Jesus. So with that in mind, we have just three or four songs. One of them will be without lyrics. Uh, three of them will just do one verse and we'll remember that time. Uh, and these are songs that go way back in the American imagination. So our first one we're going to do is Blessed Assurance, an old Fanny Crosby song from the late 1800s. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And Fanny Crosby is definitely a name you should know. She wrote hundreds of hymns, and she did a lot of it without being able to see. So we want to welcome you to worship this morning, and let's begin with a prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and be together, even online this morning. And we pray that as we hear your word, we might be inspired by the tenacious faith of those who seek you out, by the tenacious faith of those who are outsiders, who come looking for the gifts of life and mercy that you bring, and that we ourselves might feast on this mercy and share it with others. We pray for Amy as she travels and for all those who are yet on vacation, and we ask your Holy Spirit to come and bless us now as we gather for worship in your name. Amen. Now, Tommy Dorsey is another name that you should know, Thomas Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey wrote this song after his wife died in childbirth. So one of the great things about so many of these Christian hymns is they were written in the midst of great sorrow, great suffering, great tragedy, and they took that and they offered it to God. So we wanted to remind you, for anyone who's carrying a special burden of sorrow or suffering or hardship, you can take that broken heart and offer it to God, and God receives it with his healing love. So this is Precious Lord, Take My Hand by Thomas Dorsey. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. 
And that one has so much pathos in it, you could really, James and I could draw that out and really sing it deeply and to take all that sorrow and sadness and place it in the hands of Jesus. Well, now we invite Mike forward for our readings from Scripture this morning, and you'll hear a reading from Isaiah, a reading from Romans, and a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. The first reading is from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And foreigners who will join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those who have already been gathered. This ends the first reading. The second reading is from Romans chapter 11. Paul writes, I ask then, as God rejected his people, by no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once obedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience. So they have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so may we be merciful to all. So in the second reading, please stand if you are able. This is the gospel according to Matthew chapter 15. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman came down from the region and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was only sent out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take away the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So ends today's gospel. You may be seated. A reminder, if you're joining us since the beginning, that our praise team's on vacation today. And so we have James Reed here, who's helping us with some old revival songs. We're reminding people that the early history of Huntington Beach was, this was a major area for Methodist revivals. They'd come and camp here, and they would have major gatherings, and they set up a huge meeting hall that's no longer in the city. Uh, but we're singing some of those songs from the faith. 
A few notes on our life together as we move into this next week. The first thing is we're starting a Wednesday noon service. So if you would like to come, we'll be in the courtyard. Please let Susan know. And um, everyone's invited to A, let Susan know, B, bring your own chair, a camp chair. And then for the people who are around you, please also bring your mask. And it's going to be a word and sacrament service. So there's going to be a reading, a sermon, and the sacrament. So it'll probably just be uh, 25 to 30 minutes max. Wanted to let you know tomorrow we were supposed to hear from Rabbi Einstein for our Monday morning Bible study where we had an interfaith guest. Rabbi Einstein's nephew is in UCLA Hospital, so we'll pray for him, Micah. He's having major surgery tomorrow, and so Rabbi Einstein's going to be there. So no Bible study tomorrow. We'll have Esra Noir, uh, a librarian at Chapman University, speaking next Monday, and then Rabbi Einstein will be the Monday after. So he's just being postponed. Tomorrow there will be no Bible study. Also take a look at our weekly email and check out one of our nonprofit partners, Mentor Me Learning is going to be doing a series of drive-in movies in the parking lot in conjunction with Huntington Beach Fire Department Foundation uh, and a few others. And so uh, we would love to have you join us uh, if you are able and you can support Mentor Me Learning's good work. One of the great pieces of history of art of literature is Homer's Odyssey. I think many of us had to read it in part or in whole, whether it was in high school or in college, even just to get a taste of the story of Odysseus meeting whoever, the Cyclops, or being lashed to the mast or whatever it was, this sort of mythic epic drama of a man who's trying to find his way home after a war. You remember Odysseus goes to war against the Trojans for 10 years. And then after the war is finished, he wants to find his way home. And as many people find after they've been in a war, coming home isn't so easy, whether we mean physically, emotionally, spiritually. It takes him 10 years to get home from Troy. Odysseus is gone for 20 years. And when he finally comes back to that place he longed for, where he belongs, where he's familiar, where he has property, friends, family, things are the same, but they've changed. Odysseus has changed. He's unrecognizable. He tells his son who he is, but his son didn't recognize him. He doesn't tell any of his friends who he is. Because, of course, there are now people courting his wife and trying to take his property, and Odysseus wants to take care of that. There's only one character in the Odyssey who recognizes Odysseus for who he is, and that's the character Argus. Now, Argus happens to be a dog. He had been Odysseus's beloved Argus when he was younger, sleek, strong, someone you could take hunting. But by the time Odysseus gets home, that dog isn't the same dog anymore. He's older. He's weaker. He's uncared for because his master's gone. So Odysseus finds Argus sleeping in a pile of manure, covered in fleas, old, unable really to get up to stand. But the moment that's so touching in the Odyssey is when Argus sees Odysseus, gone for 20 years, Argus recognizes him. It's a very touching moment. The old dog who can't get up and run to the master lowers his ears and wags his tail because his master has finally come home. Odysseus doesn't want to blow his cover, so he keeps walking, but he begins to weep. He begins to weep because he's been recognized by someone who loved him. And he begins to weep because he'd love to be with his beloved dog, Argus. And so this image of a dog who sees through the intervening years, who sees through the change bodies, the change circumstances, to be seen, to be recognized, is to finally feel like you're at home. Now, this isn't just an isolated circumstance. Plato, the great Greek philosopher, writing 400 years before Jesus, he says, if only philosophers could be like dogs, they wouldn't have to be taught to discern wisdom. They could just sense it 
recognize it, see it. If only you could be like dogs, is the paraphrase of Plato's admonition, to be wise by your nature, to be discerning by your nature, to be like a dog. Now, hopefully, if you were listening closely to what Mike read, you don't have to ask, why is he talking about dogs today? Uh, they go, well, boy, the praise team goes on vacation and he starts talking about dogs. It's important because this gospel is oftentimes one that people stumble over because they wonder when Jesus has this interaction with the Canaanite woman, they say, well, that doesn't seem very nice. We read it with the sociological lens of our time where these kinds of interactions would be somehow demeaning or racist or misogynistic or whatever you want to call it. But let's not impose our lens onto the story. Because when Jesus encounters this woman, she is the Argus of our story. She is the only one who recognizes the master. She is the only one who sees the Lord, which is why she says, Lord, have mercy. She is the only one who understands the gifts that he's bringing. I would eat crumbs off the table of your children. If Jesus talks about the sheep of Israel, this Canaanite woman is the sheepdog. And she's fine with it. It's her role. She just knows who the master is when her ears go down and her tail wags. And unlike Argus, she can walk. And she does walk. And she comes after them. And she's begging for mercy. Her daughter being tormented by a demon. Her daughter being tormented by evil. She begs for mercy. Now notice the disciples in this story. They tell Jesus, send her away. She's bothering us. They are not so interested in recognizing the giver or his gifts. Rather, they're interested in just not letting people get too close to something that they have an angle on or something they have a hold on. And it's true that religious people can get near to Jesus. And rather than begging for mercy or eating from that table, which is set for the family, Rather than eating that feast, they spend their time wondering who they can send away next. That's been the disciples the last three weeks. Who can we send away? We don't have resources for them, the feeding of the 5,000. They're getting too close to you. This lady's bothering us. Jesus, send her away. We can imagine they had already tried. And they figured, well, if she'll listen to anyone, she'll listen to Jesus. And so there's a sense in which Plato was right about philosophers as we should be right about Christians. Be the kind of Christian who's a dog. A dog who can discern the face of the master. A dog who can discern the gift of wisdom. A dog who's willing to eat even the smallest morsel of mercy, trusting that with that comes the healing of God. With that comes the healing of God. And that's why this interaction between Jesus and the Canaanite woman is so delightful. He doesn't call her a wild dog. He doesn't call her like a pig dog. He says, you're like a household. The household dog just doesn't have a place. And again, she says, I'm fine with that. I'm not a sheep, but I do want to eat from the table. Now, you know, the language of the Canaanites, the ancient biblical uh, enemies of God's people in the Old Testament. Uh, they use the name Canaanite even past the time of Jesus as a self-identifier. But it's people who are outside the story, people who don't belong to the story, people who maybe messed up their place in the story. When the Canaanites get kicked out of the land long before, it's seen as an act of divine judgment against how they had organized their society and lived. And so this idea of being a Canaanite is belonging to a group of people who messed up their place in God's story. And this is a great moment for us to pause and to say, if you don't feel like a dog, maybe you felt like a Canaanite, someone who's messed up the place in God's story. Things that we've done, things that we haven't done, things that have been done to us, things that we've thought, things that we haven't thought, things, you know, all of the complex of life where we say, well, I was on the way, but I kind of messed that up, and now God's not going to find me. This is actually the next part of the story, is that if the Canaanite is faithful like a dog, God's even more faithful as a dog. Sometimes I think in the story, we just think, well, Jesus is having an off day. The exemplar of faithfulness is the Canaanite woman. And heaven knows she is an exemplar of faithfulness. 
Jesus himself says so, but we should never think that Jesus isn't himself throughout the entirety of the story. Jesus himself, the example of fidelity and faithfulness, what a poet in the 19th century called the hound of heaven. Now you could say the hound of heaven is the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit being the spirit of Jesus, that God himself is the dog who seeks us out. God is the dog. It's like the avalanche dogs digging in the snow to find the people who are buried you can no longer see. Uh, God the dog digging in the rubble after an earthquake, smelling for people who are uh, encased in cement or crushed with rubble. It is God who will seek out every person familiar with their scent, familiar with their voice, familiar with their call, so that he can feed them with his mercy. So there was a, that famous poem called The Hound of Heaven that talked about all the ways that people were fleeing from God, even just within their own minds, and how it was that God was going to constantly snit, sniff them out, seek them out, offer them food. So there's no way that you're going to mess up your place in God's story. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Like you can do bad things and you can mess up your life. That's true. But it will not change your role in God's story, namely that God knows you, God loves you, and God will feed you with mercy no matter where he finds you. Even if you end up in a place unexpected, he will still offer you the same gift. And that's really the remarkable thing about what we had in those two readings, one from Isaiah and one from Romans, that kind of now surround the gospel message. It's this idea of how expansive God's seeking out is and how wonderful God's gift of mercy is and how important it is that God's people live according to the divine gift of mercy. The reading from Isaiah, God says, my salvation is coming it will not be delayed. Maintain justice. I mean, it's almost like you can imagine that in a war movie or something, they get the telegram. Or now for our time, you get the text message that says, my salvation is coming. It will not be delayed. Maintain justice. This is one of the things that human beings do when they lose hope is they give up on justice. Or when human beings don't see how something's going to turn out, they may, they don't maintain justice, or when human beings become afraid because we no longer feel that we belong to each other, we fail to maintain justice. So this should be a word that we all keep during this pandemic time. My salvation is coming, it will not be delayed. Maintain justice. Be committed to setting up a society where people get the right thing according to their human dignity, according to their human worth. Maintain justice, says Isaiah. But part of the maintaining of justice is expanding the boundaries of justice. Part of maintaining justice is expanding, expanding the boundaries of justice, which is why in this next verse, God's coming salvation is a wider embrace than what people expected. God talks about bringing foreigners to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. And to us in 21st century California, that doesn't really elicit any response, but the idea that God would bring foreigners to worship in the temple of Jerusalem violates so many things about the temple that made it the temple. But God is saying, I will bring people who don't belong into the gift and they will be made worthy of the gift by my bringing them in by my invitation, by my love, by my mercy. This is why you can't mess up your part in God's story because the reason you're in God's story is because God's brought you to where you are in grace. And so he says this, God says, I'm gonna bring the foreigners and my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. You know, that money that we sent to Japan, to the little village there, you'll remember the story started with a preschool that we found out with more information was a three-story building, the tallest building in the village. And then the 120 people that were in the school were people who had evacuated to the school needing to be rescued. And now the money that we've sent is going to be helping children, helping re-equip children with things that they've lost. 
and also re-equipping sacred buildings in the village. We're gonna get a roof tile that we can inscribe something on so that we'll have an imprint in this place. Your mercy will be remembered in this place. And a great verse would be a version of this verse, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. If you go to the cathedral in Los Angeles, the cornerstone of the cathedral in Los Angeles says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And so Isaiah is saying, God's mercy is going to bring in the people who were not part of the story and welcome them in love. And so this is an important reminder that the way God operates inspires us to operate similarly. People who are not part of our story, how do we welcome them with love? People who are outside of our story, how do we welcome them with love? And by every indicator as a society, we aren't doing the best job of that. So we have mentally ill people just wandering around the streets, the homeless people sleeping in the bushes. We have so many ways that we need to figure that out and expand and maintain justice. <clears throat> now, the other part of that is what Paul says in the book of Romans, which is almost now the opposite problem. Now that Jesus has come, now that the revelation has happened, Paul says, now that we are being called into this grace, this mercy in the story, what about God's own people? In this case, Paul's own people, the Jews. Jesus' own people, the Jews. He goes, because they're not embracing the message. And Paul says, what are we going to do? What are we, not what are we going to do, but what are we going to make of this? This is how Paul wraps up the book of Romans. At the beginning of the book, Paul says, you are part of this story because God was merciful to you. You did not belong to this story. You were not uh, a character. You were one of the dogs not part of the sheepfold. You were all dogs. And now, says Paul, God has brought you in through his mercy and made the dogs members of the household. I actually think that could be one way we understand Jesus calling this woman a dog is she gets made a member of the household even though she's not one of the sheep. It's sort of an idea of how Jesus and his mercy will welcome others. But now, says Paul, Paul says, look at the effect of the unbelief of my people. He said, now you have faith. Now you've been welcomed into the story. Their unbelief generated a great gift, which was our faith. And he goes, now God is going to offer them the same mercy he offered you so that they'll be brought in the same way you were brought in. We'll all be brought into the kingdom of heaven by the same gift, which is the love and grace of Jesus Christ, all of us. There will be no one who's there who somehow got in with some other criteria. It all is the same gift, the crumb that falls from the master's table that the dog is lovingly eating for the sake of healing her daughter in the gospel is the same table that all of us will be welcome at because we have been made sons and daughters of the heavenly father through the grace of baptism. So Paul says, if, if their unbelief creates faith in you, imagine what God's mercy will do when they have faith, what God will create, what God will do. So you'll see that our readings this morning are universally expansive, talking about God's own people, the people of the covenant, talking about people outside the covenant, the Canaanite woman, even the foreigners in Isaiah, talking about how God, by mercy, is creating a house in which all can live and pray and belong because all are eating the same food, mercy. We might say then for each of us, we have to ask, how is it that I share in the food of the master's table? How is it that I, like the Canaanite woman or like Argus when he sees Odysseus, how can I, with lowered ears and a wagging tail, recognize and love? Well, one of those moments is going to happen very soon. It's going to be communion, a literal eating of the table of the master. But the other is reading your Bible, joining in prayer, doing works of mercy, showing love. And so the question is, how will you eat from the master's table? But also, who will you feed from the master's table? Who will you feed with the love of God? Who will you feed with the mercy of Jesus? Who will you feed that they can know what it means to belong to such a great house? And that's part of our faith. And that's part of what God's given us 
and part of what we share. God, we eat your mercy and are transformed in love, and now we feed the world with the same gift. Amen. Well, now James Reed has an old revival song that we're going to play a special music, The Old Rugged Cross. All right, and now we will be offering our words of belief together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, a reminder that you can offer your prayers on the chat. So if you would like to offer prayers, we'll be collecting those now. Our first is for the Welton family on the passing of Aunt Margaret. And so we'll pray for Margaret's uh, death and also for the Weltons. A prayer for Kathy Patton, and you'll remember her from um, LCR days who was admitted to the hospital yesterday. And so we wanna pray uh, for Kathy. Also, we want to offer prayers for Eric Glicker, who's returned home from uh, the hospital this week, uh, for Dave Wiggins, who's returned home and transitioning to care that we'll talk about um, in the coming days. And then also a, par a prayer for Bill, who is recovering from surgery, and um, other members of the LCR family who are in a place of respite and recovery. We wanna pray for Mary Catherine's grandson, John, who's in the Marine Corps, who is diagnosed with COVID-19. And also Richmond Ludwig, who's leaving this afternoon for his uh, beginning. And in fact, here we have a prayer for Richmond. So we'll pray for Richmond as he leaves for basic training today. Let us offer our prayers now to God, trusting in the love of God and the mercy of Christ for all these things that we hold in our heart. We give you thanks, Lord God, for the life that we share in you, for the table that is so sumptuously decorated and dressed, for the food that falls off the table and feeds all the nations of the earth, feeds those faithful people that weren't even part of your family, but look to you as the Lord, look to you as the source of mercy, look to you as the ground of love. We thank you for faith like the faith of the Canaanite woman. May we also be dogged in our pursuit of your love, dogged in our pursuit of your healing, that we also might be proclaimers of who you are and what you have done and brought to the world. We pray for those who have died, especially for Margaret. We pray for the Welton family as they grieve her loss. For all those who are grieving, we pray and ask that you bless them with your love and mercy. For Kathy, who's been hospitalized, for Eric, who's returned home, for Bill, who's recovering from surgery, for John and the Marines with COVID-19, and for those beginning their new chapter, especially Richmond, as he goes to basic training today. May you bless him in his travels, bless him in his transition, and bless his family as they uh, adjust to uh, him being away. So we ask for a blessing upon him and all those who serve in our armed forces. We pray for those who are leaders of our community, for those who govern in our city, our county, our state, and our nation. We pray for all of those who are affected by heat and fire. We pray for all of those who are affected by the virus in their work, in their health, and in their life. And may you bless them and bring us to a place of recovery. May this time continue to uncover in us uh, the riches of your mercy and love. We pray for our preschool, 
as they begin their uh, kindergarten camp tomorrow in preparation for the school year. May you bless them in that work, bless Cassie and the teachers and staff as they care for those who are young amongst us. All these things we offer to you, O Lord, uh, trusting that you love us, trusting that you hear us, and asking that you bless us in your name. Amen. Well, as we were just reminded in the gospel, you don't have to be a dog to eat from this table. Though to have faith like that, to have wisdom like that, is desirable. But you are welcome there. You have a place there. God has made you a son or daughter by baptism, by grace. And so now we sit at the table and we receive this gift of mercy and this gift of healing. We remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we have mercy from the Master's table, the body of Christ, broken for you. We have the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus, we thank you that you feed us from your table. We, you feed us with yourself. You are the mercy that we eat. You are the mercy that we drink. <clears throat> Bless us as we are connected to you, that we might... Um, be strengthened by that, transformed by that, and share it with those whom we meet. And we ask that in your name. Amen. Well, over a hundred years ago, Huntington Beach was a place of great revival where Christians would gather and camp and sing these songs and draw close to Christ. And so we hope that being in Huntington Beach over a hundred years later, uh, that we can be those same people revived in grace connected in the spirit, telling the story, and spreading the name of Jesus. And so this song I think everybody knows, and this will be our last song before the benediction, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already become. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright 
shining as the sun. We'll have blessed days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So there'd be no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun for 10,000 years to look on the face of God, to be renewed in that, and to be ever joyful, finding new things to love about the face of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. And so now we pray, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you this week, and we'll see you next Sunday.